praise the Lord. Praise His great name. I'd like to welcome all of you back again to the class A, B, C. I trust that you are all fine and that you are in good health. Today, we are on the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. Let's turn to the book of Jonah chapter 3, please. Jonah chapter 3. Verse 1 to verse 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach the message I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to to the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, this morning, I thank you for this wonderful book. I thank you for your presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit. May you anoint this lesson. Anoint the preacher, the hearers, and the readers. We give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. We pray in Jesus' marvelous and glorious name. Everybody say, Amen and Amen. Now, let me give you a short introduction concerning this book. First of all, let us look at the content. What is this whole book all about? Is it about the fish, the great fish that swallow up Jonah? I don't think so, because the word fish mentioned only four times in this book. What about the city of Nineveh? It is also not about Nineveh, because the word Nineveh only appeared nine times in this book. Then you may say, it must be the man called Jonah. The answer is also no, because his name only appeared 18 times in this book. So you may ask me, what is this book all about? It is about God, the great God. And who is mentioned 38 times in these four chapters. It talks about the love of God, how you and I should share it. There's so much about the content. Let's look at number two before we go to the lesson proper. Number two is the critics. Do you know there are many, many atheists and the so-called scholars down through the centuries had questioned the authenticity of this book because they cannot accept the fact that there is such a big fish that can swallow up a human being. Do you know who was behind this attack? It is none other than the devil. The devil hates the book of Jonah. In fact, the devil hates three books in the Old Testament. The first book that he hates is the book called Genesis. Because in this book, it predicted the incarnation of the Savior that will come through the seed of the woman. The second book, that the devil hates is the book of Daniel because in this book it predicted the second advent or the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the third book that the devil hates is this book called the book of Jonah 
You may ask me why? Because in this book, it predicted a type or a form of the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. This is found in Matthew 12 and verse 40, where Jesus said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be. How long? Three days and three nights. Where? In the heart of the earth. There are four chapters in this book. I have four outlines here. Running from God, running to God, running for God, running against God. So let's start with the first one. The first point. Running from God. Here we see Jonah protesting. There's chapter one. Let us consider the charge. Found in Jonah 1, verse 1 and verse 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go, go to where? Go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh. That is the charge given to Jonah. So the charge was very clear. He's supposed to go to Nineveh. Do you know? What was actually the city called Nineveh? It was the capital city of Assyria. It is located 500 miles or 800 kilometers away from where Jonah lived. It is what we now know as, today, the northern Iraq. The northern Iraq. So after hearing the charge, what did Jonah do? Look at chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah arose. Where did he go? Instead of going to Nineveh, he went to Tashi. Yes, he went to Tashi. That's what the Bible says. He went to the opposite direction as to what God told him to do. He ran to the opposite direction, as you can look into the map which I sent you a few days ago. It was about 2,500 miles away. That is almost 4,000 kilometers away from where Jonah lived. Do you know what was this place called Tashi? It is what we now know as the southern Spain. We all know Spain is a very beautiful city near to the sea, an ideal place for relaxation and for enjoyment. I'm sure all of us like to go to Spain one of these days. So here, there were two places, symbolically speaking. All of us, either we are on the road to Nineveh, or we are on the road to Tashi. Nineveh represents our place of duty. Tashi represents a place of ease and enjoyment. So here you can see every Christian got only two roads to tread upon. Either you are on the road to Nineveh, or you are on the road to Tashi. There's no middle road in between. Either you are on the road to Nineveh, that is to revival, or you are on the road to Tashi, that is the road to relaxation. One road is doing the will of God. The other road is disobeying God's will. So I want to ask you this morning, which road are you on today? Are you on the road to Nineveh, that's to revival? Or are you on the opposite direction towards Tashi and you're going for east 
and relaxation. So we have seen the charge. Now number two, we see the chase. He went the opposite. And now you see God was aftering his life. So he used two ways to go after his wayward servant. Number one, he used the storm. We can see in chapter 1, verse 4. But the Lord, the Lord sent out. Who sent out? The Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea. So much so that the ship was about to be broken up. So here you can see that this was no ordinary storm. This storm was sent by God. And we know the sailor from Tashi. They were all expert sailor. They were not amateur. But in chapter 1 verse 5 says they were terrified. They were afraid. Because this was not just a storm. It was a deadly storm. What else did God use to chase after Jonah? Besides, he used the storm. He also used the sailor. He used the people that were in the ship. First of all, he used the captain of the ship. We can see in chapter 1, verse 6. The captain came to him and said, What do you do? Old sleeper, wake up. Call on your God. Maybe your God will save us. Jonah, in chapter 1, verse 5, he thought within himself, if he went all the way down to the lowest part of the ship, nobody would be able to find him. But God sent the captain of the ship, went all the way down to find this man. Number two, he used the sailor of the ship to speak to his life. The sailor want to find out who was the culprit that causes this storm. So they cast Lot. And the Lot, according to chapter 1 verse 7, it fell on Jonah. I mean, there were so many sailors, so many other people in the ship. Why was the Lot only fell on Jonah? It was because of God. Many will say this is a coincidence, but I don't think so. Because in Proverbs 16, 33, it says the Lot may be cast into the lap, but the decision is from God. Here you can see nobody can run away or escape from the hand of God. God is actually was actually aftering Jonah's life. So they interrogated Jonah. Who are you? They asked. Where do you come from? What is your profession? When they came to know that he was a prophet of God, they were afraid and they asked him what should be done of him to calm down the storm. That's where Jonah told them. All they need to do is to throw him right into the sea. So we have seen the charge. We have seen the chase. C-H-A-S-E. Now we see the cage. C-A-G-E. Chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is what I call the lockup. The lockup. Or the lockdown. The lockdown. Today, most Malaysians, because of the COVID-19, we are all locked down in our individual homes. Jonah right here, is also experiencing a lockdown, but he's inside the fish stomach. 
you may ask me for what reason the reason was because god was disciplining this backsliding and way word prophet now imagine through his backslidings do you know how many things that he had lost number one he lost god's provision in chapter 1 verse 3 he has to pay his own fare number two he lost god's friendship now god instead of becoming his friend now became his enemy now god was aftering his life number three he lost god's voice before he can hear god's voice but now god had to speak to him through thunder and lightning and through the stormy sea number four he lost god's presence chapter 2 verse 4 jonah said i have been cast out of your sight so he lost the presence of god number five through his backsliding he lost his desire to pray everybody in the ship were praying except jonah jonah was sleeping chapter 1 verse 5 number 6 he lost his testimony when they came to know that he was a prophet of god he lost his influence for good and last but not least he nearly nearly lost his life did you see that if god didn't prepare a great fish on time to swallow up jonah he will lose his life can you see backsliding is very very costly we pay dearly when we backslide or when we run away from god let me tell you that so number one running from god jonah protesting now we come to chapter two point number two running to god no more running from god he's running to god so now we see jonah praying let us see first of all the explosion the explosion chapter 2 verse 1 then jonah prayed to the lord his god you see when jonah was inside the fish belly chapter 2 verse 1 it says then only then jonah pray before that he didn't pray but now you see him jonah prayed to the lord his god from the fish belly so here we can see the explosion jonah exploded in prayer and where was the place that he prayed right inside the fish belly we all know what a fish belly is have you ever seen anyone vomited before oh just think in your mind all those mess that came out from the person's mouth when it spilled upon the floor oh what an order that filled that room isn't it true that smell oh that order i don't think any one of us will be able to bear it now how many of you want to pick up all those mess imagine jonah was right inside the fish belly what a place to pray under that kind of a condition am i right no wonder chapter 2 verse 2 look at his desperation he said i cry out to the lord because of my affliction he says out of the belly of show i cry hey look at this verse 2 he cried nobody will cry unless they are desperate 
Here we have a glimpse of what he has gone through. And he he was not there just for few hours. He was there for three days and three nights inside the fish belly. Oh, you can imagine. You can imagine how he must have felt at that very moment. Now, I want to invite you to look at the scripture to understand the amount of pain that he has gone through. Verse 2 say, he say, look at my affliction. Verse 3, he was in the deep, the heart of the sea. Look at verse 5, he says the water. And also he talks about the seaweeds that was wrapping around the head. That means he was about to be strangled. Look at verse 6, the earth with its bar close behind him forever. In other words, he couldn't get out from the fish belly. He said forever. He was trapped inside the fish. He tried to get out, but couldn't get out because of the bar that closed on him. Look at verse 7. He fainted. He fainted. Verse 7. He nearly died. He was hanging between life and death. He felt unconscious at certain moment of time. And that's where he remembered the Lord and his prayer went up to God. Can you see the explosion, the prayer, the amount of pain that has gone through? Then what happened? You see here, because of his prayer, he had a breakthrough. Yes, because he prayed in chapter 2, he exploded in prayer, three days and three nights in the fish valley, and when he began to pray, there was a breakthrough in his life. Let me tell you, prayer will always bring breakthrough to our life. This man prayed for three days and three nights. He not only experienced a breakthrough, he also experienced a breakthrough. And he came out from the fish mouth. Did you see that? So not only we see the explosion. Number two, we see the expulsion. E-X-P-U-L-S-I-O-N. The expulsion. Chapter 2, verse 10. He says, So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The fish expelled Jonah out of his mouth. Can you see? Power of prayer. The fish cannot stand Jonah's prayer. And through the prayer, God answered his prayer. God spoke to the fish and the fish threw Jonah out onto the dry land. So we see running from God, Jonah protesting. Then running to God, Jonah's praying. Now come to chapter 3. Very quickly. Running for God. Jonah's preaching. Running for God. Jonah's preaching. Chapter 3. First of all, let us see the call. Chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. The second time. I thank God that our God is a God of second chances. The moment we fall, usually the devil will come and tell us that our ministry is finished, that our failure is final, that we have no more hope for recovery. But I thank our God that our God is not like that. He is a God of second chances. Yes, you may feel God. But God will give you second chance again to respond to him. The same way he gave to Jonah, he will give it to you. So the call, that's number one. Now let's look at number two, the cry. The 
cry. What do you see here under the cry? Jonah chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 4. Let's look at verse 4. He began to enter the city on the first day walk and he cried out. What did he say? Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Forty days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. First of all, let us see the pedestrian preacher. Chapter 3, verse 4. Do you know why I call him the pedestrian preacher? He was some sort of a street preacher. He preached in the street. Yes, right here. Look at verse 4. On the first day's walk, he was walking. While he was walking, he also preaching. He was the street preacher. So when he preached and he says, 40 more days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. He was not preaching right inside the church or inside the synagogue. He was preaching right in the street. So the first thing we learn is the pedestrian preacher. Number two, we see the prophetic utterance. Prophetic utterance. He prophesied 40 more days, the city will be overturned, will be overthrown, exactly like that of Sodom and Gomorrah. He only preached eight simple words. Eight simple words. You can count it. Eight simple prophetic words. In Hebrews, it's only five words words. Imagine his message was short. It was simple. It was straight to the point. It was searching and it was frightening. It was alarming and it was disturbing. Do you know what happened? The whole city repented. The whole city Believe in God. We can see in Jonah chapter 3 verse 5 to verse 9. From the king all the way down to the little children. All the way down to the animals. All of them repented of their ways. They turned from their sin. They turned from their violence. Well, you can imagine in your mind. What a great, great revival that has taken place right in the city of Nineveh. In just one day, the whole city of 120,000 men plus children all turned to the Lord. I've been preaching for nearly 40 years. i never seen such things happen in my ministry before. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen that? How did this man do it? How did he do it? We just ate simple words in his sermon. And the whole city turned to God in just one day. Why Jonah's preaching is so powerful? Of course, we believe that God works. That's for sure. Holy Spirit was there. God was there, and that is the what I call the spiritual aspect of it. We cannot deny that. God works. Because of God works on His Word, that's where we see such things happen. But I want you to see another aspect of it. Why His message is so powerful? I will call it the physical aspect. I will call it the physical aspect. Why do I say that? Now, let's look at his appearance first. Let's look at his appearance. How did he look like after he spent three days, three nights in the fish belly? What do you think? I believe he looked horrible. Don't you think so? 
his body will be bleach. You know what is bleach, right? His body was discolored. Yes. The color of his skin must have changed after being soaked in the acidic stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. And also his eyes. I believe it's reddish in color. Have you ever been to swimming before? After you swim for some time, when you come out from the sea, water, look at your eyes. You'll be red in color. His hair, probably curly, stick together. His body, smell fishy, smell like a fish. Right? You see, sometimes God will bring us through difficult moments, difficult situation, and through our experience, through our experience, so that it can add weight to our preaching. So I believe the people, when they hear the message, when they look at Him, they believe the message. Because through looking at Him, they believe that God is a God who punishes sin. And also they learn that God is also a God who will pardon sin. Yes, He will punish if we don't repent. And if you repent, He will pardon sin. That's what Jonah went through, isn't it? God punishes him when he was in the fish valley. But the moment he prayed, God pardoned him. And I believe it's through this, through his experience, through how he looked like, and through his message. That's why the whole city turned to the Lord and believed in God. So here we see the pedestrian preacher, the prophetic utterance, now we want to see the punishment nullify. Number three, the punishment nullify. Chapter three, verse ten. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their wicked ways, and God relented from the disaster that He had said He would bring upon them, and He did not do it. Isn't that amazing? One man gets right with God would do. When one man corrected his way, his life will affect many other people down the road. Do you know that? When one man's life is right, he changed the world that is around him. Can you imagine what God can do to your life if only you get right with God? You will never know what God can do through you and for you. Here, we see only one sentence. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the whole Nineveh was brought to his knees. Now listen, if you and I are, are writing the book of Jonah, do you think where we would end the story? I'm sure we will end right at chapter 3. Am I right? Because we all like happy ending. Isn't that true? But here, the Bible didn't end at chapter 3. It still got one more chapter. And that is chapter 4. And that will be my final point. My final point. So here you see number 1. Running from God. Jonah protesting. Number 2. Running to God. Jonah praying. Then running for God. Jonah preaching. Then lastly. Running against God, Jonah putting, P-O-U-T-I-N-G, 
putting. So running from God, running to God, running for God, running against God. Very quickly, right here in chapter 4, we see Jonah putting, means showing his temper. He wasn't happy. He was resenting. By right, he should be rejoicing and singing. Here, we see him sobbing. In chapter 1, verse 5 to 5, we see his displeasure. His displeasure. Who was he angry with? He was angry with God. He was angry with God. Do you dare to get angry with God? If you ask me, I dare not. I respect God. I honor God. I won't get angry with Him. But Jonah did. Yes, he got angry with God. Why was he angry with God? Because he was angry with God because God was merciful. God was merciful. Instead of punishing the Ninevites, God spared them. And this was what made Jonas mad and angry. So number one, his displeasure. Number two, let us see his delight. In chapter 4, verse 6, the Lord prepared a plant and made it, made it come over Jonah, providing a shade for him. And Jonah was happy. He was grateful for the plant. Then number three, not only his displeasure, his delight, number three, his discomfort. Chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, after giving him the shade, providing him a plan, chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, God sent a worm and then damaged the plan, killed the plan, and God sent a east wind. And the wind was strong and was hot, and Jonah wished that he would die. So here, God provided the comfort, he removed the comfort, and Jonah was mad, and he wished that he would die. So we have seen his displeasure, his delight, his discomfort. Now lastly, before we end, the last thing is his deviation. His deviation. Chapter 4, verse 9 to verse 11. Let's look at verse 10. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came out in the night and perished in the night. Verse 11. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between right hand and their left and much life stop. Here you see the deviation on the life of Jonah. Instead of fulfilling God's purpose and will, you see how far short he has fallen. Here Jonah's concern was only for a plant. While God's concern was for the souls that is in the great city. So can you see the contrast? Jonah's concern for a plant and God's concern was for the soul in the great city. See how far Jonah's deviation was. How many of us are like Jonah today? Some of us, we care more for the plants in our garden, things in our home, more than the souls that are out there. Isn't that true? Whereas God's concern is for the souls that are in the city. Where is your concern today? What is your concern today? 
Are you concerned more for the plants in your garden? Or are you more concerned for the soul that is in your city? You see, God's concern and our concerns is far, far apart. And I pray that you won't, you and I won't deviate from the purpose and the will of the Lord. May God help each one of us to get our perspective right. That our main concern will not be things or on plants or on things that is in our garden. That our main concern will be on the souls that is in the city. May we not lose our vision for souls in this year, 2020. Shall we pray? Father, this morning, we thank you for the book of Jonah. Lord, once again, you reminded us on the importance of souls. Once again, we can see your heart going after souls. Even those people that do not know you. Those people who have sinned against you. And yet your heart goes out to them. Father, we want to pray for our church that we will not lose our vision, that we will not see the things that we have are more important than the souls that are out there. Lord, give us real concern today that we will have a passion for the people that is in our city. We want to pray for our happy life group that in the days to come, that we are going to start. Touch every leader's touch every members in our church that we will be mobilized to reach out to the souls that are out there in our city. We give you all the praise, all the glory. May your presence be with each one of us. We give you all the praise and the glory. We pray in Jesus' wonderful and glorious name. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you for listening.